Good evening, everybody. Today is Tuesday, April 23rd, 2019. It's about quarter of seven, and it's been one of those days, again, where we don't see the sun too much. So let's hope that changes. I'm the Ward 5 City Council, Ian Beauregard. I uh, can be reached at 774-297-4939 or 508-584-6919 or A. Beauregard, B-E-A-U-R-E-G-A-R-D at C-O-B-M-A dot U-S. So we have a whole lot of things happening here this evening. And uh, first, um, how would I say it? My um, partner on the road here for these um, ward meetings for the past over three years now is a gentleman named Ron Freddy. And uh, Ron works downtown in the courthouse system with a special program that every single time that he speaks for five minutes, 10 minutes here, he makes himself available, people find out that this service will help them get through some situations and uh, which is advantageous. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you, it doesn't cost you anything. So I'm going to defer this now to Ron. We're going to have several things going on here and a lot of guests. And the idea is for let everybody know what's going on in this city of 100,000 people, maybe more. And um, any way that we can service you to the best of our ability, because let me tell you, it can be challenging at some point. Pass on this information to everyone else. I have some of my colleagues here right now. I have at large um, Wynn Farrell, and I have the president of the city council, Moses Rodriguez, and other people will be bopping in, as, um, and I'll let everyone know. So thanks, everybody, for joining me, and I'll pass it over to Ron. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Ann. And thank you once again for having me uh, to speak at Ward 5 City Council meeting. I appreciate the opportunity. Hopefully I can provide some information that will be useful to you. As Ann indicated, uh, we have a nonprofit organization called the Greater Brockton Center for Dispute Resolution. And we provide free mediation services to those people in Brockton and uh, 28 other surrounding communities. Um, our, uh, charter says that we're to provide mediation services in neighborhoods where disputes occur. Uh, we do landlord tenant types of disputes, those that aren't already in housing court. Uh, we do consumer disputes, we do business to business disputes, uh, we do interpersonal disputes, we do family disputes, uh, where we basically cover the whole gamut. If you are in a dispute or you know somebody that's in a dispute, uh, you can refer them to us. And again, as Ann indicated, our program is free. We're funded through the state. You've already paid for our services. So that's why it costs you nothing to participate. Our initiative this year also includes a program with the 29 police departments in our communities that we service. And what we're doing is we're handing out community information cards uh, to police officers to give to people uh, so that when officers go to a particular call and they are not empowered to do anything because it's not criminal or it falls outside the jurisdiction, instead of them merely telling people, oh, just go to court, you need to take people to court, uh, we're going to ask them to give out a community information card and see if we can step in and help them. Additionally, I always like to talk about scams that are going on. Uh, for those of you who may have heard me speak before, you may be familiar with some of these things. The new scam out is... Uh, it's actually an old scam, but it's being repeated again. It's called the jury duty scam. Have people heard about this? All right, somebody calls you on the phone and says that, uh, hello, I'm calling from the Brockton District Court, and I just want to let you know that the judge has just issued a bench warrant for your arrest for not showing up for jury duty. Okay, and uh, the immediate reaction is, I never got a notice. I never got a call to come to jury duty. And they said, well, the judge is mad because people aren't showing up to jury duty. So he's issued a bench warrant for everybody that didn't show up today. So you again say, well, I never got notified. And they'll say, well, spell your last name for me just to make sure I have it correct. And then they'll look it up on and they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're here. Now just verify your date of birth for me, OK? And again, the more uh, excitable you are about those types of calls, the more information you're likely to give out to people that will use it for nefarious purposes. So. The other uh, scam that's going on, again, is the IRS scam. Uh, 
the people calling, claiming to be from the IRS, and they're going to have somebody come arrest you if you don't pay money right away. The grandma, grandpa scam, where people are calling up saying, uh, Grandma, I'm in Florida, and my mother doesn't know I'm down here, and I got arrested, and uh, I'm going to wind up in jail if you don't send us some money. We just heard of a case where a woman went to Target and paid $5,500, or bought $5,500 with gift cards. Uh, and, and gave the numbers over the phone to people. Once you give those numbers out, if you buy a gift card and you give numbers over the phone to the people who are claiming to be who they're not, then they can cash those in. So just as a reminder, the IRS will not accept payments from you in gift cards from Walmart or Apple or uh, Target. Uh, a sheriff will not accept gift cards uh, as payment for any kind of a bail or anything like that. So, and people that basically are calling you on the phone saying that you need to send them or give them money immediately, uh, typically you need to slow down and think about how legitimate this may be, okay? Uh, so we don't want to see our uh, elderly in particular uh, being taken advantage of by these scammers. So I like to mention it when I come to speak. I have some brochures that I have uh, for our program. Uh, I have some community information cards and I have my business cards. <coughs> What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be, as other people are speaking, I'm just going to be walking around handing these out. So are there any questions for me? If not, then I'll just turn it over. I know you have a lot of speakers today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ron, as usual. And what happens with a lot of these instances, it's not you yourself that needs it, but you might come into someone that does. And believe me, over the years, just as being a city council for only a little more than three years, there have been more than one person that has been able to take advantage of this, and I just find that vital, especially that they don't have to come out with the extra money or anything like that. It, it's confidential. Uh, you know, four days a week, they can come to your home if there's situations of that nature, etc. Because unfortunately, some things arise when you're minding your own business from insurance issues, uh, uh, situations with, um, you yeah, know, whether it's car or house insurance and other uh, difficulties, and they, they can be resolved oftentimes. And a lot of times, too, someone in a particular divorce situation or something like that that might be of assistance. Now, I just have. Um, like I said, many different people coming up to talk briefly, a couple of people with um, some, I always say, issues. Um, my two at-larges are here at present, but I'm gonna ask Vivian to come up here. Vivian is with the Community Garden, and a whole lot's going on with that, so I'm gonna give her a few minutes here, a couple of minutes here, pass out information, be able to speak on this particular issue, because people say, oh, nothing's going on in Broughton. The real thing is, is a lot's going on in Broughton. You just don't know about it. So here's a, another great thing going on in Broughton. Hi, everybody. So uh, I'm here representing the Brockton Community Gardening Network, and we are a branch of Brockton's Promise. We are the Healthy Start branch of Brockton's Promise, and what we do is we coordinate all the gardening efforts at the schools, at some of the churches uh, within the city, and I'm here just to let you know that we meet typically once a month. Our next meeting is tomorrow, 2.30 to 4.30 at the Downtown Center for Community Engagement, which is in the Harbor One Bank building. Um, we will be meeting also in May and in June, and we try to have guest speakers. Tomorrow's speaker will be Matt Dyer from Growing uh, the, Gre sorry, Greening the Gateway Cities program, uh, a program that uh, enables you, if you live within a specific uh, area of Brockton, to get free trees. They will plant them for you. You can choose from, I think, 30 different types of trees. They're, um, they're, their goal actually is to plant another 1,000 trees here in Brockton. So you can't beat free. <laughs> so if you're interested in more information about uh, Greening the Gateway Cities, you can certainly Google them. Uh, just put in Greening the Gateway Cities and there is a link on their uh, website. It says Brockton. You click on that and the map comes up and you can just determine is your school is your um, business, is your home within that area? And if it is, there's a number you can phone them at and uh, they will meet with you and you can choose your trees and they will plant them for you, free. Oh, did I mention it's free? <laughs> so keep it in the back of your head and please look into it. Um, 
In addition to that, next month at our meeting, we are having a representative from Massasoit Community College from the biology department. She's going to talk about sustainable landscaping. And uh, one of the things that we try to do within the gardening network is we try to uh, utilize sources within the city. So we've partnered with the community colleges, with Stonehill College, and um, they've been so supportive in sharing information, in um, giving us the resources that we need to grow in the city. And um, so I welcome you to volunteer. I welcome you to get involved. And I welcome you to check out our website. We uh, have a Weebly website. It's called brocktonspromisegardens.weebly.com. And uh, check us out. And the information about our meetings is on there and where the gardens are in the city. And ultimately, uh, we would love to have people get involved and help us out, especially in the summertime, uh, because in the summers when the kids are no longer in school, there's nobody that takes care of the gardens. So, uh, you know, that no child left behind kind of thing? I say no garden left behind. So uh, we welcome your involvement. Thanks a lot. Thank you. This is pretty impressive because they started out with, you know, this project and now I think they have 25 of them, whether it's the Boys and Girls Club, there's a proposal to do one at the intersection, was it White Ave and Montello? So enhancing some, I would say, blighted areas also. By the way, the gentleman, Department of Conservation and Recreation is Matt Dyer, and he can be reached at 781. 540-4305, you have 40 trees to choose from if you live within that designated area. They have already planted over 1,400 trees. And understand, if you have a small business and you want a tree in front of it, fine. Your home, um, you know, relatives that might need something. The trees are everything. They enhance the area. They keep you cool in the summer. Warmer in the winter, it just, it's just, how would I say, it's a, it's a win-win situation, and again, <coughs> that whole uh, attitude that it's free. Now, I have a special guest this evening, whoa, Officer Bill Healy, <laughs> and uh, he's going to speak to you about one of the problems we've had, and in the winter, it's illegal parking, and then the plows can't get down your street, or they're blocking your driveway, etc. In the summer, it's illegal parking, and they're blocking your driveway, and it's because people are having wild parties till two or three in the morning. Now, I don't know if that's any of you in the audience right now, but we get many, many, many calls about this, and justifiably so, because you can have parties, but you've got to consider the people that live around you. So I'm gonna let Officer Healy go over a few things, and all this can be passed on to everyone else, okay? Thank you. Good evening, uh, everybody. Hold on. There we go. Um, my name is Bill Healy, police officer here, city of Brockton, past 31 years. I run the Neighborhood Business Watch, formerly known as Crime Watch. Uh, a beloved counselor, Ward 5, reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and asked me to come discuss traffic in moving violations. It's been a passion of hers since probably forever, but more recently the past month or so. Um, before I get into that, uh, anybody that wants to start a uh, crime watch, neighborhood business watch, log on to the Brockton PD website and you'll see neighborhood business watch. Click on, all of my information is there. Call or write me and I'll get back to you on how to start up a watch. I've passed out to everybody. We're gonna discuss what, in the end, please, and anybody else, this is the Q&A too. Some of the things you just mentioned remind me so I can answer some of those, some of those concerns. I passed out to, I think everybody got a copy, the winter parking ban. I also came armed with financial statistics from 2018. I don't even think Ian has been privy to this information. Um, I have it all here, hot cold stats that are entered into the computer every time a citation is written. Regarding the winter parking ban on your sheet that I passed out, that ban goes from December 1st to April 1st. Throughout the entire city, there's no parking on the even, even numbered side. 
in the downtown uh, district, what's cons uh, considered the downtown district, are all of the streets listed in alphabetical order here. There's no park in either side. Throughout the last X years, you're allowed to park in the parking garage. And uh, whenever there's a snowstorm, several police officers in the city are out there working with the DPW, towing or tagging and or towing cars in violation of this ban. So you could also get this in the event you lose this today. It hasn't changed in 100 years, but it's also on the website, not as of today. The website to the City Hall's credit, it's updated quite frequently. During 2018, from the 1st of January to the 31st, police officers in the city of Brockton have written up 3,032 uh, tickets, 3,032 tickets in a one year period, generating $141,695. Ann left on one of the most important things. I don't think she thinks this is enough. So, $141,695 in ticket revenue came to the city. Keeping in mind, in the state of Massachusetts, we don't have a quota, it's against the law. So, did, did you get the amount that I just, yes. okay. So even if we wanted to, or some wanted to, try to double this amount to get even more tickets written, the chief per se can't even order people to go out and give moving violations. It's against the law. It's a, it's a, it, 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 quotas are against the law in Massachusetts. Um, no. Yep. Any of that go to the state? So, um, p parking tickets, all parking revenue goes to the general fund. None of it's, none of it's to the PD. None of the parking uh, revenue, parking tickets, goes to the state. Um, The parking ticket, I actually gave you a copy of what the police officers have to cite people. And I have a breakdown, not to bore anybody, but you'll see all of the violations in the amount. In the, uh, uh, one more thing on the winter parking ban. On the winter parking ban in 2018, of that 141000 $102,650 was generated. That last storm we had of the season, and uh, Captain John Hallisey, who's in traffic, charge of the traffic commission, he actually uh, came to a council meeting, I think it's two or three weeks ago. In that one storm alone, they towed 60 cars. And it was his opinion, and in my opinion, as somebody who's been around for 31 years, the captain for 32 years, that's a big day and a lot of tone. So DPW goes down the street, they can't get through because people are parked on both sides. Call is made to the police department. The designated guys that are doing towing and tagging during that uh, winter storm watch, and they go to that area, they usually try to give a courtesy call, honk at the horn and stuff. Nobody comes out, cars tagging, cars towed. 60 cars is a lot of cars for a storm that wasn't even that big. Other storms, there's been more cars towed, more cars sighted. Um, Parking, any parking concerns oh, during, during the summer? You just mentioned? Yeah. Ann mentioned, and this is a problem, but this is an easy problem to resolve. What I'm about to say, if, if during the summertime or any time during the year, if somebody is parked in front of your driveway, right in front of your driveway where you can't get out and they've ventured off to a uh, soccer game, softball game, whatever it may be, and you can't get a hold of those person who so rudely parked in front of your driveway, kind of a common occurrence, call the police, the police will come down, and the police may look down, may, may, may make an announcement to the group next door, nobody answers up, the car will be tagged, the car will be towed. If you don't call the police and all you do is vet, uh, vent to your neighbor, how are we to know? But that's something that not a police officer in this city would hesitate to do, just out of sheer ignorance. Anybody that wants to park in front of your driveway to block you in, make that call. And we'll get the call before we get the call. 
and same with the other counselors. I think it's absurd. So everybody has to understand that there's people here watching. You make that call, the police will arrive. 411. No, 911. 911. No. No? No. That's not an emergency. It would be an emergency if your wife was pregnant and she had to be and she, and she had to leave. That would be an emergency. If you look out, that would be a non-emergency call, 508-941-0200. Again, and I'm being serious about any type of medical issue, and that car's blocking the driveway, 911, and don't be afraid to call it. Um, but that car, believe me when I tell you, now I'm not saying the response will be one minute, because on the priority, it's like a triage system, the way the, uh, police officers are dispatched, one, two, and three. Priority one being an emergency, priority three being the least emergency, such as a disturbance or a parking violation. Police could be there in one minute, the police could be there in a call like that in an hour. It depends on the activity going on. Um, so bear that in mind, but certainly a response and a toll will happen, and I don't know why people wouldn't call. Ann has mentioned on several occasions that's a big issue. Uh, be it summer or be it winter, Narrow street, you've mentioned narrow street. You look out and you honestly know that a car, an emergency vehicle, be it ambulance or cruiser, can't make it down that street. Again, ignorant people parking any way they feel like it. Call the police, police will come down. Police will tow, tag, give a ticket and tow. It will happen. If you don't call, we don't know about it. It's that simple. Again, don't call the counselors. 508-941-0200, uh, no, police are coming down to tag and to tow. The big part of this is that the repeated situation, if you see cars you know, constantly parked in illegal situations, people can continue to call and report this. Yeah, so I, I, guess there was, I guess there was an issue, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it, uh, the, the issue that, that got in all heated up, was uh, Belcher Ave? Well, that was, that was one, one, well, one street. I have, I have Sherman Street. Sh Sherman Street. street. Yeah. So okay. uh, Belcher was an issue. Uh, calls were made s several times to the police department. At the end of the day, as the five or six designated offices for tagging and towing during that winter storm, they reached that street. For those of you that live by the West Side or are familiar with Belcher, Winifred, et cetera, off of West Elm, the street's as wide as this cafeteria. So there wasn't an issue, there wasn't an issue with ambulance, fire truck, police cruisers getting down that street. Anybody familiar with that area? And I'm familiar with the whole city. Anybody, so in the triage of things, that became a number three priority. We'll get to it when we get to it. In the meantime, plows may have been calling, plow drivers may have been calling to say, we can't get down this street. That's a big concern. If the plow can't get down, that's a huge concern. It's priority one when it comes to the winter being an issue. Um, other parking issues? Before, well, I just, again, that ahead. was um, also for the businesses, because we have businesses it says one hour parking in front of their business, two hour parking, and some people just camp out, leave their car for six, seven hours during the day. The downtown? Um, all over, let, Camp Hello, Montello, yeah. Let, let, let's, stop, let's start with uh, downtown, for example. I know that the people that work for Bob Malley mm -hmm. are, are very aggressive, and they're out there, <laughs> and they're out there all the time walking. I can tell you that the police department, police officers, per se, aren't going walking the beat of downtown tagging because we have designated group doing that. So that, that should be taken care of downtown. I don't believe they stretch out to Campello or Montello, but in both of those areas, it just began a week ago, there are walking beats in the Campello, downtown, and Montello business districts where two cops walk with ticket books and if there's any violations that are uh, handicapped uh, parking, as an example, they'll tag, but they're not standing by to find out how long that car's been parked at the side of the road because that would require somebody like people, uh, well, Mally's group, traffic division, 
to actually like maybe I think they uh, I think today with modern technology I think they actually scan a, a plate in the, in the thing it used to be chalk in the old days so they know if they come back it's been more than an hour or so so that's how lo those areas are handled um, I don't know if she has any more parking issues but I just wanted to point out too so that's the parking parking issues there's moving violations as an example you go through a stop sign chapter 89 9 I gave you, um, oh, I didn't give you anything on that. I have the stats here though. Um, a million different things, uh, going through a red light. Um, any type of arrestable infraction, driving without a license, operating under the influence. In 2018, from January 1st through the 31st, The department generated $371,775 in moving violations, speeding, stop sign, violations, etc. 6,603 of those citations were issued. 6,603. Some here could argue, I think the council may be one, it should be doubled. I'm just telling you that the police department uh, is actively. Actively, we have a designated uh, four-man uh, traffic division, only four, designated just for traffic violations. The police department as a whole also enforces the laws of the Commonwealth regarding moving violations. Um, of that 6,603 total amount of citations that were issued, there were 3,423 civil violations, meaning you went through a, uh, through a red light, not a big deal, here's your $50, $50 ticket. 1,502 warnings. I mentioned before it's against the law to have a quota system. The police aren't all bad, you'll get a warning. Maybe instead of a citation, you ask, well, why, why that? I get a citation before. It's police discretion, whether you like that or not. We determine when we pull over that car, who gets an actual ticket, who gets a verbal warning, who gets a written warning. It's been that way for a thousand years. I say it never changes. Then you get into too many issues. Um, I find this hard to believe. This is probably because they don't, it says eight verbals, hundreds of verbals, hundreds. Um, there were four, out of those traffic stops, 485 people were arrested on those traffic stops. 485 people were arrested and criminal complaints. As an example, you go through uh, flashing red lights on a bus. Big offense, big no-no. You go in front of a clerk magistrate for such an offense. There were uh, 1,105 complaints. Not, that's just such a school, that's not school bus alone. <laughs> I knew she was thinking school bus alone. No, that was uh, accident. Say an OUI accident, somebody was driving under the influence bad accident, that person goes to the hospital, you can't arrest him because he's in the hospital, there'll be a complaint taken out against that person for a future court date. So I personally think the stats financially, again, and the percentage of that is um, Council of Fowler. But what's the uh, X dollars go to the state on moving violations and X go to the general fund? We'll go with 50-50. Yeah. I, I think maybe more goes to the state. I'm not sure. But we'll say 50-50, 50 to the general fund, 50 that the, the state gets into, into, their, into their revenue. Um, I, it's a hard job that we have when it comes to everything that has to do with policing. Help yourselves out. I'm out there all the time on the road. I've lived here for 35 years. I'm out there doing road construction work. Nobody cares. Everybody speeds. 60% of the people on here was speed in the past week. It's out of control, no one's paying attention. I think it was three years ago, 11 people, pedestrians, were killed, walk, pedestrians killed in this city. 11, three years ago. Then there was a big ca campaign about teaching people to walk in a crosswalk. So uh, slow it down, especially when you come to these construction sites. Beginning Monday, it was on the website again. I think the website's pretty good. They really, they really do keep it updated like I've never seen before. And a lot of construction work going on. Why does so much construction work happen in, this, in the summertime? 
vacation time, asphalt. They don't. They can't pave in the. They can't pave in the or, or dig too deep in the freezing. <coughs> excuse me, in the freezing weather. So the asphalt companies are open, and now it's bombardment with new roads being paved and a whole bunch of gas company work coming up beginning Monday. Be patient. Don't speed by me. We're going to have our traffic guys out there, our designated traffic guys down the street, double the fines in a work zone. So this year we're going to be aggressive with that, doubling the fines in a work zone. So if it was a $50 for speeding, it's now 100 It's dangerous out there. You see a bunch of cones. You see people wearing vests, those yellow, green vests, lime color vests. Slow it down. Real dangerous. Um, are there any questions regarding uh oh, go ahead, ma'am? Yeah, I, I do a lot of work in the city, you know, just in the gardens as, as I mentioned, and I'm constantly in need of where am I gonna put my car so I can get my tools out and that kind of thing. And so many of the parking um, areas in the city say permit only. And I don't know how to get a permit only for those spaces, so how do I do that? Okay, well that's Okay, well, if it says permit only, eight out of ten times it means that you need to get it through the parking authority. I'll be happy to talk to you about that. We can work something out, believe me. Uh, no, it's not. It's across the street from City Hall. It is part of the administration of City Hall. But that one I can help you with. That doesn't fall under the purview of the police unless somebody illegally parks and then they have to get towed. But uh, anyway, um, I do have one for you. A gentleman wanted to know about jaywalking and violations there. Yep. So okay. th there, is a, uh, there is an ordinance on the books. It doesn't come under, if you look at your, what I handed you out, handed out the uh, parking violation and moving violation. There's an ordinance about jaywalking like there is, I think, in every community in Massachusetts, to be honest with you. We, we as a whole, don't enforce it. Just like you can't spit on the street. There's an ordinance about spitting on the street. Forget it. Um, I, I, you know, I worked uh, on Friday at Montello and Center Street. They repatched that surface there right by W.B. Mason. It was amazing to me amount, the amount of people with me standing there, two guy people across the street, that if I turned my back for one second, they were walking outside of the crosswalk and they were walking across when they should have stopped before the lights turned. And I think even some of those people came like professional people. So that's broken and can't be fixed, the jaywalking. And it, and it, is, un, it is unbelievable because everybody's walking across with the earbuds and not paying attention. You, the driver, have to be really careful, and with that comes slowing down. If you go slow enough, you're not hitting anybody. You're not hitting the person that doesn't realize he shouldn't be crossing against the traffic. One more thing, unless you have anything else, Ann had brought up to me, like the, the activity of um, pulling over cars or when you see a violation. If I had left here from the station, let's say a little further, Let's say from where I live up by Christie's Drive to get here at 630, and I, and I look down roads to see somebody parking in the wrong direction, somebody parking too close, if you look at your ticket thing that I showed you, too close to an intersection, you can only be 15 feet, I think it's 15 feet, from the intersection, it's a, it's a violation. If I drove here and, and was looking, I would never get here. I would, ne I would never get here. And I'm, gonna talk, I'm not talking you know, flagrant stuff, the erratic driver, we all have blue lights. That stuff we're always on top of, any, any type of danger. Or most importantly, if you have an issue with a particular tractor trailer parked on your street overnight, starts up in the morning too loud, you have to call us. Because we may not know on any of these side roads that that's what's going on. So it's up to you to be aggressive by calling versus us always having to be, so it's, it's being proactive. You see something you do with the police or reactive, you get a phone call that there's an issue going on, or an ongoing issue. And if there's ongoing issues going on and you don't want to call the police because you're afraid, for whatever reason, uh, click fix or the tip line, the anonymous tip line, totally anonymous, for stuff like that. All night truck parking every single night's been going on for a month. And you don't want to call the police. The anonymous tip line, which is under my, under my, uh, under my name with the uh, neighborhood business watch. You'll see, you'll see, uh, um, um, what did I just say? Tip See, line. Tip line. No. 
you'll see that you'll see that you'll, it will say it will say tip line. Link onto that. It's very easy, and I don't even know who it is who's calling. So you could use that as a tool also about stuff like that. Be re, be be uh, reactive. Uh, we'll be reactive. You be proactive when seeing stuff like that, and together we'll lower her blood pressure, <laughs> especially before next winter starts. And we, we do our best to, to tag and tow. Don't block the what? Don't block the box. I mean, don't block an intersection. Oh, yep, yep, yep. You know, is the police department actively in trying to enforce that? <clears throat> so those signs and communities, uh, we talked about this a couple of years yeah, ago with a, with a school the box, yeah. or with the school crosswalks. The schools wanted, and I and I, I go to all these council meetings. And if my memory serves me well, the councils will uh, hear. I think those signs, those yellow signs, about the school crossing, are like four hundred dollars a piece. The big concern was in the winter time, and then they finally, they tried to resolve the issue by having the custodians remove them each night. But at one time, they were out on the street, like cross, you know, police crosswalk, crosshair. They get destroyed by plows. They get destroyed by people that aren't paying attention. Those aren't even the one I'm referring to. I'm referring to intersections. For example, present in Main Street, Lee yep. Parkway. Yep. Terrible intersection. Yes. You know, everybody knows how busy that is. Um, Know, during commuter hours. Yep. So cars trying to go east or west yep. on Center and Legion Parkway. Yep. Cars are going north on Main. Yep. The okay, we're talking about the intersection of Center and Legion Parkway yep. going north and south. So yep. cars, they have the green light yep. that are going north. So they have the green light, they block the intersection. So then the light changes, the cars going east and west are stuck. So in police jogging, it's called bottlenecking. <laughs> And it used to be unbearable before they did Reynolds Highway over. As you travel down Pleasant Street east, cars would move out into the intersection before it was all redone. Huge issue for decades. I know what you're saying. Uh, if a police officer was, was traveling either up, either up center or traveling north on Main Street and saw that, it's citable. It, $100 fine. $100 fine. It's, it's citable. So you're asking about signage. That's something that Ian could bring up as uh, somebody on the traffic commission to, to, to broach that subject about getting signage. But, it, but it's citable, and mm -hmm. pe again, people, instead of trying to get through that yellow light quick enough, they find that this, and that's not just there. Right. That's a um, lot of places. Because I do see it affect emergency personnel because of the neighborhood health yes. center. It's traveling, a heavily traveled road with Going towards Brockton Hospital. Very, very, very busy area. I mean, that, that's yeah. something for her to bring up at the. Well, uh, that that's being um, reviewed. Any kind of major intersection, and we're going to have all Colony Planning Council speaking briefly on different things like that in a few minutes. Uh, meanwhile, uh, 508 941 0200. And keep on calling back if you're looking to hear something. Get the person's name, get the information. I want to take. Thank Officer Bill Healy. Just so everybody knows, he is going to be here so we can answer some other questions and people can come around. And uh, what, I, what I emphasize is that it is top secret. They're not going to say, oh, Joan in the blue house across from you call five times to complain about your truck. No, that nobody says anything like that. But I mean, you can call me. It's 774-297-4939 if there's a situation. But the real reason I wanted to emphasize this is because of the safety. We were actually very alarmed two years ago, well, not quite two years ago. This is so alarming. There was a, a small street. People were parked on both sides. The fire engines couldn't get down the street and someone need, uh, was having a you know, medical emergency. And the firefighters knocked on the door and the people refused to move their cars. The police had to come down, and that was jeopardizing someone's safety. And this is why I've been really adamant about this, and I really pushed the issue around the party season. We want people to have great graduations, great barbecues, etc. But at the same time, you've got to consider that you share this planet with other people, this city, the street, and it's just very important if there are problems to you know call 508-941-0200. And if you're not getting the response, yes, please feel free to call your city council. Okay, do you hear one more thing? Yep. And, and if anybody, I'll be, I'll be staying here till the end. I have every street broken down as to the amount of parking tickets per street 
in moving violations if it's important to you. So some will say, as an example, on Court Street, they speed down here all the time. What are you doing? Well, a couple of years ago, there was, there was $80,000 in tickets on Court Street alone. So I have that money amount and the amount of citations if anybody wants to look into it. That's all. Okay, again, I want to thank um, Officer Bill Healy. Now I'm going to ask, uh, Senator Brady has joined us, and um, meanwhile, I have two guests here from Cambridge, Massachusetts, that are talking about an infrastructure bill, and we were fortunate enough that our senator has uh, gotten on to sponsor it, and I'm rather excited about this, because the number one request from most of us ward councilors is, when are you going to pave my street? And as far as I'm concerned, it would be great if it would stop tomorrow. Um, but anyway, um, if uh, the senator doesn't mind coming by and saying hi here, and uh, letting everybody know that he is prepared to work very hard to bring more money to Brockton. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. And, and we all work as a team in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, so I don't do it alone. Our, our representatives who represent the city of Brockton have been dealing with the budget. The governor presents his budget, and it goes to the House of Representatives, and they deliberate the budget, and then it goes to the Senate after. So this week here, as we are speaking, our House colleagues, which is Representative Michelle Dubois, Representative Jerry Crean and Representative Claire Cronin. Jerry, uh, Jerry I'm sorry, Jerry Cassidy. I always, I work with Jerry Crean, I forget my uh, mistake on that. But anyway, it's Representative Jerry Cassidy, Representative Michelle DeGuan, and uh, Representative Claire Cronin. They're in the State House this week deliberating the budget and trying to get more funding for Brockton. And they do have some figures on some local aid and Chapter 70 money, because our schools are in serious need of funding. And We've got a lot of pieces of legislation that have been filed for our schools. There's thousands and thousands of bills that get filed every year. Some don't see the light of day and some do. And last year we were coming close. We did increase some funding for the school department and for our schools in Brockton, but it was not enough. And this is as well as not just Brockton, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So this is a priority in the, just to let you know, last year, Chapter 70 money, which goes to our schools, was $175,377,972. Local aid last year was $21,649,227. Local aid is unrestricted, so that's given to the city of Brockton, and it's up to the local elected officials in the mayor's office to decide where that money spent. The Chapter 70 money has to go directly to our schools. So the governor this year for the upcoming budget has proposed $183,271,000 for Chapter 70 money for the schools. The House has increased that, and this is just a proposal because it still has to go to the Senate, and then as, if there's differences, it goes to a Commerce Committee, and it still goes back to the governor. And sometimes the governor supports things, and he has a right to veto things. So if he vetoes some items that we put forth, we have to override his vetoes. So the House of Representatives has proposed $184 million, $61,886. So it's higher than the, what the governor's proposal is. And that's good news, but they're delivering all this as we're speaking. Local aid has been proposed at $22,233,756. And to let you know, we did meet with our, some of our school officials, our superintendent. We had the head of the Board of Education at the state level visit Brockton a couple times. We visited the high school. We visited some of the elementary schools. And I'll tell you, uh, we, we hear nothing but great, great things about our school system in Brockton, but without the state funding, we wouldn't survive. And through the Ed Reform Act that passed in 1993, it evened the playing field to get more money for communities such as Brockton. But there's been changes since. I've represented not only the city of Brockton, several towns around Brockton, and they're always going back and forth, well, why does all the money come to the cities? Why is it going to the towns? And we don't have the infrastructure we had years ago, the, 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 the co commercial base. You know, the shoe industry, what Brockton was built on, is long gone. So we don't have enough commercial tax base to bring in revenue, so we have to depend on the local aid from the state. And um, the Ed Reform Act helped out tremendously, and that was from 1993. And I know our council, Wynn Fowler, was a mayor back in those days. And he worked with our state delegation very well to get money from the state. But there's been changes. There's different funding formulas. The Board of Education has changed the foundation formula. There is other proposals out there. So they're looking to change that. And, our, and if things aren't done correctly, I know our school department has, has a lawsuit with other cities 
to the Board of Education if the funding doesn't come back adequate for cities such as Brockton, they're going to go forward with the lawsuit. In the meantime, our state delegation, which I mentioned our state representatives and, and myself in the state senate, and a lot of other cities, gateway cities, are working diligently to get more money for cities like Brockton. So the House is deliberating their budget now. It's got to come to the Senate afterwards. Um, also, um, our roads, as, as Councillor mentioned, are in deplorable condition. We, we have a couple different sources of funding for the roads. There's federal dollars, which is CDBG money, Community Development Block Grants. That goes to the more inner core parts of the city, the less fortunate sections. Then we have Chapter 90 money. That's roads from the state funding for our roads. And they can go, depending on where the mayor and the traffic commission and the city councils, they put in um, proposals and it's up to the mayor and everybody else to decide where the money's spent. They try to do the most difficult streets first, the worst streets, and then the highly traveled areas. Now, uh, we got service tra tra transportation bond money to do Belmont Street over several years ago, Route 123. Then they end up digging it up again because, as was mentioned by a police officer, the gas company's got to do jobs, construction jobs. So we just got some more money to pave that. That is finally in the process of being completed. Route 27, which is Pleasant Street, which the police officer mentioned, Reynolds Highway was a nightmare with traffic accidents, et cetera. It still is difficult. I'm not happy with the whole design they did because I think they have to put signage because people still get on the wrong lanes when they're going left off Reynolds Highway onto Pleasant Street. And I've mentioned this to the state transportation boards, but they still have not got it done because I worried about even if there's snow on the ground, and the plows try to do a good job, but if there's snow covering those lines to take a left turn only and go straight, you can't see where to go. And I've asked them several times to put some signage up top because even though there's less access, there still is access up there. And it's a difficult, confusing thing when you got two lanes going left on Pleasant Street, you got two lanes going straight across from Reynolds Highway to West Street. So we're working on that. And then a couple other things, the Ganley Building downtown, which uh, it went out for a proposal over a year ago. It had another proposal this year. They're talking about uh, moving the unemployment office, tearing that building down and moving the unemployment office, which is in another location downtown, and putting some other state agencies downtown. And I did talk to Massoit, they're looking to have some courses maybe over there, but there's a long process and there's two adjoining uh, walls. One abuts the property of the Ganley Building and Joe Angelo's Cafe, so that's a combined wall with that business. And then the other is the uh, Phil Cohen's business, which is Ideal Pawn Shop. That's a combined wall with the existing Ganley Building that's been vacant in the other building. And there's a lot of safety issues. So I found out today they are going out for a proposal. Well, they have already gone out for the proposal, I should say. They are coming up with a, an announcement within 30 days when they're going to start the work in it. But I found out there has been engineers and other state agencies in there making sure they do it right because it is a big public safety issue when they do start tearing down the existing wall. You don't want these other walls that are abutting the other businesses to fall or harm anybody. So that's a big issue. Preparation is 90% of the work to get ready when they do the job. And um, a couple other things. Revenue is a big issue. We need revenue in the city of Brockton. I served as chairman of revenue the last couple of years. I'm now the chairman of public service. But revenue was down last quarter. The changes in the federal tax codes and with the president, he's giving, you know, giving major tax breaks to the multi-millionaires, but most average people who are just getting by are not getting the tax breaks. And I had to pay more taxes this year, just probably like everybody else in this room. So we're trying to get more revenue in the Commonwealth to make up for the, some of the federal cutbacks. And we passed some laws. We uh, increased taxes on Airbnbs. Those are the bed and breakfast. And we're not trying to hurt the ma and pa that might rent their cottage down the Cape for two weeks to a friend or family member. These are the B&Bs, the bed and breakfast that rent for months on at a time, or the places in Boston that rent over near Mass General and so forth. So we increased the small tax on that, also with the gaming legislation. Now there's uh, casinos that have opened up in the Commonwealth. There's one that's opened up in Springfield, and they, they, they are bringing about $25 million to the city of Springfield alone. And there was concerns, because there's one proposed for Brockton, and there's one up in Everett. And some of the people that live around the fairgrounds in Brockton were concerned there's going to be increase in crime, what about traffic, et cetera. So some of the fears that were mentioned, I brought it up to what's going on in Springfield. All the businesses around the casino there have cleaned up their businesses. And some of the 
liquor establishments where you know there's illegal activity going on in the men's rooms or the back rooms or whatever, they've actually been able to hire more police officers because of the revenue, able to clean up the areas and clean up their businesses and then the facades of these businesses, it's like night and day. They've done frontage, the facades, they've also created a hockey rink for the kids and they do not allow anybody under 21 to go into the casino but there's restaurants that have increased and done well and then I did ask well, what about if the casino gives away free food on a particular night and so forth? Is that going to affect a local restaurant? There was a restaurant that was a couple blocks away, not in the close proximity to the casino, because all those businesses have cleaned up, but it was an Italian deli and restaurant. We had lunch there afterwards, and he says he had a goal in my business to begin with, so it hadn't affected his business either way. So it's been positive to the city of Springfield. I mentioned about the jobs it created, because there's, there's food workers, there's casino workers, etc and they've increased a lot of jobs for the people. Now the one in Everett is still going through the Gaming Commission because of what happened with Wynn and his problems. Uh, there's obviously supposedly a new company, but they've got to make sure that everything's done legally with the new company. And then the third one is the South Shore District. Now they have not approved, and this is all up to the Gaming Commission, not up to us as legislators, we gave the power to them. There is one third one proposed for the Brockton Fairgrounds that hasn't been approved and hasn't been denied yet. And then any Indian tribes that were proposed, there was one in Taunton and one in, in down the Cape, they haven't been recognized as an Indian tribe to even go into the bidding. Doesn't mean they can get federal jurisdiction down the road, because they can, but I'm just talking at the state level. So there's, there's one that's approved, there's possibly another one up in Everett that's going to be approved. They've already built the facility, but they've got to make sure everything's done legally. And then the third one, again, it's up to the Gaming Commission whether they approved it. But Again, on Belmont Street, 123, we use state funding for all that. If the casino was already up and proposed and, and approved, that would have been, they would have paid for Route 123 to be done. Not state funding, we could have used the state funding for other entities, because there's a lot of roads across the city that are in deplorable condition. And we've worked with our councils and the local officials here in the mayor's office to come up with where are the most priorities needed and so forth. So, um, other than that, we're looking at other sources of revenue. There was a millionaire's tax that was going to go on the ballot last year. They found out, uh, they went to court. It was determined it was unconstitutional because they could not put a ballot question to the, to the voters to decide where the money's being spent. It's up to us as legislators when it's a state initiative. So there is some pieces of legislation filed to put that back out there and, and be approved. But in the, the premise was to go, the money was going to go towards the schools and, and for transportation, which I think 90% of the people are in favor of supporting, but it couldn't be worded on the ballot question. So now there's another senator who's filed some legislation to vote on that as well, and, and hopefully if it passes, the problem is it's not going to, it's got to go through a constitutional convention, so it's going to take a couple of years. But we're looking at all other sorts of revenue. Also things that the young people do, which is way over my head, fantasy sports and all that stuff. We are finally going to be getting revenue from that. That's being implemented as we speak. But right now the speaker didn't want to put any tax, new tax initiatives during their budget deliberations. They're trying to work with what they do and what they have for revenue now. And then they're going to deal with the any new tax proposals down the road after the budget's done in the Senate and the House. And there's amendments filed on all these things, but they may not see the light of day, as I mentioned. Um, and, and a couple other things that we're looking at, I, I did, we did pass a piece of legislation last year to help our police department. So when you rent a car, there's a $2 fee that's charged to a rental fee. That helps with police training, and it'll help to get the proper training for our police department and work and get more funding. I was, I was also on public safety for a couple of years when I was in the House prior to becoming a senator. And I visited the police academies, I visited the firefighters academy up in Stowe, and I actually had to put the uniform on. And I give credit to these guys because it's a lot of weight on your body, and I'm not as young as I used to be. And the mask is on and everything else, and then they say if the thing's dinging, it means the oxygen isn't working, you gotta keep moving. Mine was working, but it was still dinging. And um, then the scariest part, not when the fire's going, because everything's bright and you can see where you're going, but once the fire's put out, you can't see anything. And they trained us to put your hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you so you know where you're at. And, and I give credit to all our public safety personnel because I, I worked well with our police department for years in Brockton and our fire department. And they do a yeoman's job, but we need more funding to get more of them on the streets. We are still not where we should have been with the layoffs from back in the 80s, in the 90s, never mind now. 
and hopefully we can get more state funding for that. And the, the biggest thing is the local aid, because the local aid, direct local aid, that gives the local cities and towns their decision where the money's uh, able to be spent. Because some money, like Chapter 70, has to go directly to the schools. Chapter 90 has to go to transportation. But unrestricted local aid, and we get money from the lottery as well, which is a big boost to the Commonwealth. A few years ago, we built the Council on Aging, and named after Tom Kennedy's mother, the Mary Kennedy Senior Center. That was all helped with state lottery funding when Shannon O'Brien was our treasurer. So we're trying to get more local aid for Brockton as well. So, yes? called your office a couple of weeks ago asking about the infrastructure money mm -hmm. uh, for the roads and um, your aide was telling me about the chapter 90 money so what you're saying is since the revenue for last quarter was down we have to live with the same conditions no I, I, I didn't finish I'm sorry I it was down as of December oh, okay. because a lot normally when people are investing in the stocks and they get high capital gains they have to pay taxes on, they normally pay it by the end of the year. And I have a lot of friends who are accounts that are a lot smarter than me out there. They told me that people weren't paying their capital gains taxes by the end of the year. But this past April 15th, and in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you had two extra days because of Patriot's Day holiday. At least revenue was up this past quarter, which was good news. So revenue was starting to go in the positive direction. And the other thing at the state level, like we all do balancing in our pocketbooks, we have to balance the budget at the state level. Unlike the federal government, which is, has a ridiculous amount of deficit spending, we have to balance the books. So we can only utilize what money comes in, we have to balance it. So revenue is up this past quarter, which is good news. Even though the economy has been good, some of the tax changes at the federal level have not been good for the average person. So, But the good news is it was down last December, but it is up this past quarter. So that's good news. Thank you. So I'm going to leave my cards here if anybody needs to contact me. Um, I've had some changes in my office. Two of the young people have moved on. Uh, another person um, who worked for me, um, he's got a higher paying job working for the Speaker Pro Temp in the House of Representatives because I'm limited to what I can pay my staff because I have to balance my budget. And then the other gentleman has left because he's running for a, another office in the city of Brockton. So, uh, I've been interviewing young people to, to work in my office, and I'm down to three people. And it's basically Al DiGirolamo is my chief of staff, and this other woman, Donna, she's my assistant chief of staff. They've been interviewing new personnel because I'm looking to put two new people on. So if anybody has uh, anybody interested, um, I'm still accepting resumes, too. So let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and for those that are very concerned about infrastructure, as they're setting this up, I'm um, going to have, um, yeah, I'll give you a moment here, Charles, to set this up, and why don't I have uh, Pastor Reed come up here to make his quick announcement and uh, about different things that are going on. I told you there's plenty going on in this city to let people know how we can service them young, old, and in between. And uh, the senator can be reached at 617-722-1200, OK? And, and Council, I left my cards here, okay. too, if anybody needs to. All right. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Well, we're not actually in this ward, but uh, we're not far away. But at our church, North Baptist, we are opening a couple of new centers. We're opening a brand new uh, GED training center the people will come in, it's all free, they get uh, to get their high school graduation out of the way, and of course that will help them with some of these uh, new jobs that are coming up, maybe even someone will be able to uh, apply for work for the senator. And then we also have opened up uh, a mobile medical clinic for women, uh, where they can come in and um, have free pregnancy tests, but also free ultrasounds. And uh, so that has already been opened. Uh, we had to close it early today because of all the construction going on in front of the church. And then we found out it's going to be like that tomorrow. But also I brought tonight, and I've sent it to some of the counselors, I had some of them already, is a list of resources that are available through most of the churches that are here in Brockton. There's a lot of community service things that are available. And uh, so if you want one of those lists, uh, I brought some with me tonight. And if, and if I run out, you can ask me and I'll e you can e I can email them to you. So uh, again, 
uh, just something, some new things. We're always busy trying to find a way to reach out and help those here in Brockton. Thank you, Pastor Reed. Yes, yeah, so we have a whole lot going on. I don't know if he mentioned the whole genealogy and his library and everything else, and this is uh, located on North uh, Main Street. And anyway, and I want Councilor Rodriguez and Councilor uh, Farrell to come up here for a moment before, uh, yeah. We're, we're glad to listen and learn. So oh, okay. We're here to support yeah, Okay, the remember this now, everybody. Uh, get up here, Mr. President, for a moment here. <laughs> You're not getting off so easily. <laughs> yes. Because I know you're, you guys are getting ready to have an at-large meeting, planning something, but I just yeah. wanted to let, you know, but. Uh, well, thank you for, uh, for having us, and uh, I'm glad that we could actually come, but we came to, uh, to basically land a year. All we want to do is listen to what's going on, because as you know, each citizen of this city actually has five counselors. You've got four at-large and your local counselors. So, that's why we try to do whatever we can to be at these meetings whenever possible. I mean, we've, we've got our own issues going on um, so that we, we have to continue to, to follow through. We actually have an at-large council meeting, which we hold um, quarterly uh, at different places in the city, and we're planning on holding the next one on the 15th, I believe. Oh, May. Okay. Uh, 15th of May. 15th of the 22nd. Oh, we'll now you're going to the 22nd? Well, we're waiting to hear from the state treasurer. Hopefully she's going to come out and talk about the water, yay, talk about yeah. the right. cities and towns. So the 15th or the 22nd, we should be able to hold this stuff up. And um, I also, um, I attended a meeting today in Framingham where the state is seriously concerned about the 2020 census that are coming down the pipe. Um, believe it or not, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on an annual basis gets around uh, $16 billion worth of federal funds. And this is through Medicare, Medicaid, and some of the other uh, Medicaid uh, school uh, funding and some of the other uh, funding that we get from the federal government. But it's all based on census numbers. And I believe that we have to do a yeoman's uh, type of work in this city to make sure that every single citizen is counted because those numbers reflect directly what the city gets back in return. Uh, there's a funding formula that basically dictates what, ta what cities get uh, in CGBG fund and things like that, and it's all based on, the, on your population. The higher you get, population-wise, the more funding you get. So it's, it's a year and a half or so away, but this is something that we are gonna have to get together and leave our politics aside, leave our feelings aside, and basically push uh, for the city. Because if you sit down and think about it, when you look at the city of Lowell, Lowell is in the books for 108,000 people, and yet they have 15,600 and something students in their, uh, in their public schools. We have 18,000 students. How can we be at 94,000? So the real number lies somewhere between 110 to 120,000, and it's up to every single one of us to make sure that people are counted in this community, and that's why I'm gonna start talking about it as much as I possibly can, because we are losing a ton of money, monies that we could put back in the pockets of taxpayers in this community that we're basically washing away because we haven't done a very good job in the last few census to make sure that the citizens of the city are, are counted and counted properly. We've got absolutely nothing to lose but all to gain by making sure that we count our people. I did some work with the Census Bureau, the last census, and one of the things that I found out personally is that there was a great deal of under-reporting number, meaning that if I lived in an apartment, a uh, two-bedroom apartment, there were six of us, uh, in my mind I'm thinking, well, there's only should be four people living in this apartment, so there must be only four of us. So two people didn't get counted. Uh, there were other instances where you had uh, people who were citizens all over the place, but there was one or two individuals who are in the process of uh, getting their status adjusted. Those individuals were left out of the census. And guess what? 
within a, a few months or so, they get their status adjusted, but they don't count as far as the government is concerned. So that's why it's important for all of us to basically leave our feelings aside, leave it at home, let's all work together to get um, uh, this city counted and counted properly because, again, we're losing a ton of money that should be coming to Brockton, it's going elsewhere. Uh, we're paying, you know, we're all paying ta you know, our taxes, but we're not doing a very good job in getting those taxes back into our community. Thank you and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you going to say? Okay. And, uh, and then Charles will be ready. I just want to pick up on something that Ian said about street reconstruction and taking care of neighborhoods. I certainly support doing all we can for downtown. I mean, we'd like to see the downtown markedly improved. But like you, I'm really committed to trying to get more work done in neighborhoods. You know, street reconstruction isn't just so that people can have a smooth ride. You put in sidewalks, the kids have a safe way to walk, both to school and to play when they're not in school. It, it's, it enhances property values, and so in the coming months and coming years, as we look at all of the downtown development and development around the city, we can't forget our neighborhoods. And when you do a street over, it actually, again, enhances property values. People are so thrilled when they can go out for a walk on a nice smooth sidewalk and enjoy a quality of life in the city, which frankly, if, if you look around, we don't have now. So I'm with you on that. And I hope, um, I just read a news flash uh, from the State House that the lottery is 100 million ahead of what it was last year. I was going to tease the Senator and say, we'll take 10% of that, but <laughs> At least if we get something, I'll be very happy about it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now Charles is going to come up here and uh, have a, f a few minutes. I don't know if you, you want to make that over here. And they're getting handouts. So uh, this is all about a bill for infrastructure money to pave our streets. A little oversimplification, but the general gist. Thank you, Councilor. I promise to be very brief. It's getting late, and the longer you sit, the less you're going to listen. I'll be very brief, I promise. My partner is Joanne Hurley. She's the person who got this started in Boston a couple of years ago, and so she's the lead advocate. I'm a recovering banker, and I joined this problem this, uh, this, to get this, this built about a year and a half ago. Quickly, I want to just describe what happens now, how most of the money is raised in this state, in every city and town, to do infrastructure, and what a better plan would be. Uh, as you, as, as Someone mentioned Chapter 90 money comes along that's for roads, but there's not money for sidewalks or for other things. The way money is raised down the city is investment bankers raise sell bonds in the private market, give the citizens and towns the money they need to do infrastructure. Citizens and towns then use your tax money to pay that money back, but there's another hook here. There are other costs to pay that money back. I looked at the 2015 uh, annual report that the city puts on the website, and in 2015, the city of Brockton had $212 million of bonds outstanding. The, the, the debt, ex, the debt uh, um, payment, debt service for Boston, for uh, Brockton in 2015 was uh, $12 million. The interest alone was $6.5 million. But then I went to page 28 on your report, and it said that all of a sudden, the cost of, of floating those bonds was $500,000. That meant that there were fees, bond counsel, uh, placement fees, commissions paid up and above the interest to get that money out, to get, for Brock to get that money out. There's got to be a better way to do that because all that and the interest, all those fees go not to city, not to borrow Brockton, but to go to investors both in, in the state and out of the state and all over the country. So there's got to be a better way to do this. What we've done is we filed a bill to form a publicly owned infrastructure bank. A bank whose sole mission is to finance infrastructure across the state. It looked like this. A bank makes loans to cities and towns, they do their infrastructure, and they make repayments back to bank, at 2%, that's it. That's it. That's it. It reduces the cost of infrastructure enormously. That's one part of it. But it also does two things. It, it circulates money within the state, so the more money, the more this, 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 this bank does, the more the bigger jobs it can do, the bigger infrastructure projects can do. That's part one. Let me show you what the bank, how this bank would work.
Our bill proposed the infrastructure bank is financed entirely by the Commonwealth. No money from cities and towns, all from the Commonwealth. Why not? The Commonwealth has already financed about 20 other quasi public agencies between 10 and 20 million dollars apiece. Why not this one? 50 million dollars of equity, 350 million dollars from the Department of State. This bank would never have to go back to the legislature again. You don't have to ask them for any more money. This bank could finance whatever it needs to finance the Commonwealth without any more money from the legislature. You don't have to go back to the legislature ever again. Ever. Uh, Finance is at lower cost. I said 2%. I don't know what you're paying for now for bonds, but it's more than 2%. And I don't know, and you don't know what you're going to pay until you get the bond in your hand. You still don't know. You can't plan ahead. This will finance the project at 2% and, and at the lowest possible cost. No fees, no commissions, no finance fees, nothing. Just, just one simple interest expense. This money stays within the state. That means the more that the, this bank does, the more the bigger projects that the bank can do. More responsive to Ms. Pallas, which that means that if you want a one million dollar project, you can do that. Take a one million dollar project to State Street to the to the to the investment bank now there's a kick out. They only think about a one million dollar project. Two million dollars maybe, five million dollars maybe, but a small project that projects to do a a, a, cro a, a crook or a, a path or a bike path, they won't even talk to you about that. But this would let cities and towns talk to a bank or any kind of project they want that they need to do this day. Uh, it would not compete with Massachusetts Bank banks. Uh, Ten years ago, when the Leslie's thought about this, the bankers killed this idea. They said, this would compete with bankers, and so we don't want to have this, this, this kind of a bank. We put in the bill that this bank would not compete with any state uh, or private or, or, union or credit unions in the state at all. The banks would not be with no ATMs, no marketing, no, uh, no private deposits, nothing from the, no competition with state banks. Transparency. Uh, the bill has two things that and other things that you never saw seen before. One, a board of directors, but second, an advisory committee that would have to meet with the, the management and board once a quarter. So if, if the bank's not working for a city of town, they can change it that year, not wait for five years to report, but to change it that year and get the change, the change done. If, if the bank is not doing what you think it ought to be doing, you've got a way to do it, to talk to it with the, with the board and the management every quarter and make changes happen. Uh, that's a, that's, you don't see that in any other state agency. Nothing. You don't see a way to do that in any other state agency you know about. And finally, uh, audited annually by the state auditor and any, uh, by a private auditor. No branches, no ATMs, no competition with state banks at all, no competition with, with credit unions. It is a concept that is happening in other states, California, Seattle, New Jersey, Philadelphia. There is a state bank in uh, North Dakota. They formed, in, they formed that 19 years ago because the state banks would not lend to farmers. So they formed a privately owned, a publicly owned infrastructure bank. That bank is now more profitable than, J, than Goldman Sachs. It's more profitable than J.P. Licks. It's more profitable than Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. This bank is, is now finances farmers, it finances uh, student loans, it finances home mortgages, it finances small businesses. It does the, all the things that you would want a small bank to do. We're not saying you should do all those things. We should be saying this bank should focus on infrastructure. Because if you don't get, if chapter 90 money doesn't come through, you can't repair the road. If you don't have money for your school, you don't build a school. If you don't have money for your police department to build the police station, you don't have the money. So this will provide that money for every city and town within the state uh, who wants to be part of the service. It's a, it's, a, it's a concept that is coming. It's a project that is happening all across the state. We should be part of it. Our bill in the legislature is informed and has been filed in the House. And we've got Senator Spoko as president of the Senate to file in the Senate as well. So you have a better shot of now getting that bill through this year. Yeah. All right, that's I'll great. I'll start the question. All right. So, I mean, I'm going to let um, Charles uh, go around here unless anybody has a quick question. We're going to have uh, Charles uh, can be, is available if anyone wants to speak to him. Just so everybody knows, again, you can call your state reps, uh, your state senator, 617-722-2000, and they'll connect you to every one, one of them. I was very excited that Senator Brady hopped on this because the number one request for those of us in uh, city council is to get people's roads paved. So uh, that's it's constantly yes. And so Joanne has one. Yes. Joanna, we're told by legislators that the most important thing to happen for this bill to move ahead is for the legislature to hear from city mayors and managers that they want this which isn't the usual case, but that's why call to your mayor's office would really be appreciated. Thanks. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Joanna. That number is 508-580-7123.
Okay. Me meanwhile, um, Jimmy Pereira is coming up here as a private citizen to talk briefly about um, the intersection of Plymouth Street and Center Street, which, by the way, is part of this whole infrastructure proposal. They've done their research. That is one of the big questions right now being discussed in Ward 5 because of the accidents that keep on happening in that area. So we want people to realize that something is being done, and I'll, I'll let him speak um, his jargon on this. Okay, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Happy to see everyone. So today I am here as a private citizen, citizen uh, so we could avoid any conflict of interest. And so I can talk about other things as well, too, so not just particular to your regional planning agency, uh, which is a public agency. And uh, uh, so I'll, I'll get to the project that we're talking about on uh, uh, Plymouth and Center. So looking at MassDOT and the project portal uh, website. So you can go to the MassDOT website. You can, anybody can do this. You could uh, basically look up any uh, intersection or road projects that's being done uh, by the state, that's funded by the state. And in particular to the Plymouth and uh, Center intersection, it's currently at 25% design, so it's still in the beginning phases of uh, planning and getting through the process for the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, it's scheduled for fiscal year 2023, uh, but the most important thing about your regional planning agency is that, and actually something that Ann uh, talks about a lot, is the squeakiest wheel gets the oil. So. Uh, our agency provides an opportunity for the public to provide feedback. So at the Joint Transportation Committee meeting, uh, we have a, a, a section on the agenda for public uh, uh, comment for any intersections or any projects that need to be addressed. So I implore everyone to please come out to the JTC. Uh, the JTC uh, basically um, <clears throat> runs that information, the feedback back to the Metropolitan Planning Organization which basically, uh, again, is a liaison between uh, the regional uh, planning agency and the federal uh, government, state government as well too. So uh, that's important. We also have a broad, it's an ad hoc bicycle pedestrian advisory committee. Uh, the, the regional planning agency also has a regional bicycle planning, uh, bicycle pedestrian advisory committee. So the point of it, an advisory committee is for us to have a, a, a committee, a group of people that are concerned, whether it be bicyclists, pedestrian accommodations, and we will take these comments and bring it to the uh, JTC or the regional planning agency or even the tr local traffic commission uh, uh, agency as well to the commission uh, itself and make sure that these needs are being addressed. Uh, of course, when you look at the infrastructure and as everyone is uh, talking about today, we need feedback. We need to make sure that we're addressing what the people uh, want to be addressed. And again, it's making sure that we answer surveys and that uh, the people come out to these meetings also included. So. Good. Yeah, any right, questions you may you. have, please yeah. feel free. And so. what, it's 70 School Street? Exactly. Okay, and uh, Monday through Friday, a number or an e um, email or something like right. that? Right, so yeah. you could visit the website www.ocpcrpa.org. You could call uh, the agency at 508-583-1833. Uh, if you're interested in the Bicycle uh, Pedestrian Advisory Committee for, for the City of Brockton, uh, visit the website uh, or the, uh, the Facebook page, rather, Brockton Ad Hoc uh, Advisory Committee. Uh, and we also have other organizations like Mass Bike, which is the bicycle advocacy organization, and uh, Walk Boston as well, who advocate for bicyclists and pedestrians. So. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. I'm not going to take too long because I got two little ones over there that uh, are asking to go home and have some fun with their toys. But uh, any questions you may have, please feel free to uh, contact Ann and she'll be able to reach out to me as well. And again, uh, visit the website www.ocpcrpa.org. MassDOT website has a plethora of information there as well. And then the local uh, uh, traffic commission does meet every month so they have an opportunity for the public to provide comments and feedback and that is the most important place for you to be if you have any concerns as well too so thank you thank you yes the, the big themes um, education and infrastructure so uh, Judy Sullivan is a Ward 5 school committee she's coming up here to tell you a couple of things and uh, I thought it was interesting that my colleagues said that they're hoping that the uh, treasurer of the state of Massachusetts comes next month because I thought, oh good, maybe she'll come with some money too. But anyway, in the meanwhile, um, it is pretty interesting to hear what uh, Judy has to say and there'll be a whole lot more going on because just everybody needs to realize this is the fourth largest school system in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and we have a whole, they have a whole lot planned for kids to do over the summer and that's important. We'll be passing that information along too. So uh, without further ado, Judy. 
Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Ann. Um, as um, Senator Brady did tell you about the Chapter 70 state funding, um, he explained all that to you, how the schools get state aid through the Chapter 70 funding, which is just starting up now that the House and the Senate are working on that. Um, so we really won't find out, our school committee won't really find out anything that we can work on until May 15th, okay? Which is usually when you'll see if there's any riffing that needs to be done. Reduction in force would happen after May, at May 15th. Okay, we're, not, we're hoping that that doesn't have to happen this year. Um, we also have a big equity in education lawsuit that is going forth through the state because the city has not been funded properly with our special education and our um, English language learners for many years now. Um, so there are some great groups out there, including the Stand for Children, which someone is going to, Brendan's going to speak from that, and um, also your mass teachers has got a big campaign on that right now too, on the funding, um, and your school committees. There's um, many cities that are also like Lowell, Springfield, that are being underfunded, just like Brockton, and we need to do something about it. That's why we're elected into these positions. Uh, we need to make sure that our kids get the best services in the city that, that is available to everyone. And this superintendent, Kathy Smith, is the person for that. And she, I don't know if people heard, but she is retiring in June. But she will be continuing on with this fight for equity and education for Brockton kids and parents. And the school committee is also with her on that. Um, you might have seen some of the um, changes that are going on in some of the schools. She's been able to do a lot for Brockton. We have a global language school at the George School, where children are now, when you sign your child up for kindergarten, you can, you can decide whether you want your child to learn French or Portuguese, and they're put into those programs right off. So your child is starting to learn a language in kindergarten in Brockton. That doesn't happen everywhere, okay? So um, Brockton Public Schools is known for their school system. Their school system is a really great school system, and this superintendent is a really awesome one that, we, that will be retiring. We will be bringing in um, interim superintendent Michael Thomas, to um, be our interim for about a year. And um, then after the budget um, is worked on, is the budget is many months until the end of June before the schools will even know what we really have for money. And we don't really get that money from the state until like July. So where a lot of your well-to-do districts already know what they're getting. It's, it's a lot difficult in a city this size with as, many low, as much low income English language learners, special ed, our special ed, because we have way more people than anybody else has. Our budget for that is a lot more than other little cities and towns. Um, the North Middle School is, we're going to the MSP right now for the North Middle School renovation and the Huntington School roof. Um, that MSP has already been here to look at the Huntington School. They'll be coming next to look at the North Middle School. They really don't come out. The MSB is the mass building authority that will bring us you know, certain amount of the money to fix these schools. All our buildings are aging, and we do need to, to you know, work on them and, in order for them to serve the students of the future. Um, after that, the school committee wants to work on Brockton High and renovating that. These four middle schools, your north, your south, your west, and your east, were built years ago as bomb shelters, when bomb shelters were built. So that's why they won't be torn down. They will be renovated, because you cannot destroy a bomb shelter, okay? So that's why, you know, some people are asking, well, why won't you just tear it down and build another school? Well, because it's a bomb shelter, and we, you know, we needed it years ago. Hopefully, we won't need it in the future. But they're really, really strong buildings. But they do need updating and renovations in the inside. Um, there's a lot of really great things going on in the Brockton Public Schools. If you, if you're on Facebook and you like the Brockton Public Schools Facebook page, the Brockton Community Schools is another thing we're going to be pushing. A lot of that, the Brockton Community Schools provides a lot of summer programs 
and programs during the year. They, they have a great youth swim program that my kids, you know, learned how to swim there. Um, in the summer, they have programs going on all summer. Um, but you gotta sign the kids up now and the brochures are out. You can go to Brockton Community Schools website, Facebook page, and you can even sign your kids up online now. So it, there's a lot of really great programs that will benefit your kids and keep them busy over the summer. Because as we know, we keep kids busy. That keeps them out of trouble and keeps them, everybody happy. So I thank Councilor Beauregard for having this meeting tonight and allowing and phone me number and email. a chance to, to speak. I'm gonna leave some of my cards. I'm on Facebook, Judy Sullivan. Uh, my phone number is 508-588-9171. And my um, email is also on the card. J. Sullivan School Committee, SC Wood 5 at gmail.com. And I'm going to leave my cards up here. If you have any questions on the schools or if you want to know, want to know a little bit more, just give me a call. Email me. I'm happy I get back on all my people that ask me questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. And people realize that you can go to all the school committee meetings. You can speak at the school committee meetings. You're allowed three minutes. And all this is, all the meetings you can attend in this city, unless it says, and it's posted executive session, which those are very rare. We haven't even had one for the city councilors in this calendar year so far. Cannot emphasize you can attend these various meetings all the time. Our last speaker, not because he's least, but um, this gentleman, Brendan, is also here to talk about schools, because I knew there was some parents, and everybody wants their kids to have the best. And it's a challenge because money, unfortunately, doesn't fall from heaven because it would be really advantageous about now and, uh, for both our schools and our infrastructure. But in all honesty, there's various opportunities here happening. And I just want to let Brendan speak for We Stand for Children. And uh, again, another person in our community doing good stuff. Thank you. Thank you again uh, to Ann, your counselor, for inviting me tonight. Uh, we had a, a very nice uh, meeting at the library a few days ago. Uh, uh, my name is Brendan Murray. I work for Stanford Children. Um, I'm actually here uh, because of what my mother was able to do for me. Uh, I have dyslexia, and she was an advocate for myself when I was very little and made sure that not only myself, but people in my class and generations after were able to get the testing and the tutoring so that I was a successful uh, student. Our organization is focused primarily on early literacy and high school success, but we are really focused this year in the session on specifically making sure that each area in this state gets the funding equitable to what it deserves. Um, and we all know that Brockton is nowhere near where it needs to be when it comes to the funding. Um, as an example, uh, Brockton is receiving about a dollar and 26 cents for extra money that it can spend that is basically a pen. Whereas in uh, West End, they receive about a hundred or two hundred and seventy five dollars more per student. That means that they can basically get a, um, a generic iPad uh, for their students. That is a very big discrepancy and we look to make sure that we're going to close that gap. Um, the way that we're going to be able to do that is the fair funding fight that's going on at the state house right now. Um, we are going to be hosting a informational session that um, I'll have uh, the bro brochures that are going to be available uh, for everyone. Um, it'll be on the 22nd of May from 6:30 to 8 p.m. Uh, and that will be at the Brockton Library at the West Branch Room, uh, and we will be promoting this, uh, we'll be putting flyers up throughout the community and making sure that everyone knows about it. Um, we also, um, we have availability for um, any kind of uh, generic letter that we have available right now. So you can take action um, just tonight by filling out this generic letter that we will be uh, handing out to the leadership of, um, in the State House. Um, and this is really important to allow people the opportunity to speak from the heart and then let people know what matters to you and why are you speaking out for fair funding. There's specific issues that you've known, maybe your a grandchild or uh, your daughter or son needs extra help and is not being able to uh, receive it because the funding is not there. We also have a phone bank that we are um, you're allowed to do a voicemail, and we're going to deliver that to the leadership. 
um, on their voicemail. Um, it allows you the opportunity to really speak in long-winded ability to, to get out everything that you really care about and why you're doing what you're doing. But we are giving opportunities in Brockton for them to, to be able to be an advocate for your children here in the district. Whether you have children or not in the district, it really is important because they are the next generation. They are the ones that are going to be educated for uh, the jobs of tomorrow, and we want to make sure that they are given every opportunity to do so. Um, I, you know, I speak from not having children, but also being a board member in the past. I was a school board member in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, and the reason why I did it was because of children that I wanted to have in the future. I wanted to make sure that they had everything that they uh, that they needed to be successful. So um, I moved, uh, you know, to the area. I'm in. I live in. Uh, I'm going to be living in Melrose, um, and it's because of the hard work of our organization to make sure that we let members be the voice. So we make sure that they have the opportunity to speak out uh, for these different uh, avenues we have to make sure that their voices are heard throughout the community. Um, and we want to make sure that they are given every opportunity to do that now. That's why we have generic letters now in front of us uh, for you to be signing. But if you just want to get more information, we have a sign-in sheet um, that's over there on the table. Really appreciate it if you would sign. Um, and we have an opportunity to become members, which is free of charge. Um, that just means you're going to attend two events in, within the next 12 months um, to just get more information about what we're trying to achieve, uh, the bills that are going to be coming forward, like the informational session, um, and just different events that we're going to be hosting. Uh, this is about information. We really are uh, an organization that wants to give you every opportunity to learn more about the funding that's coming forward. Uh, we don't, we're not taking a position on any specific bills, but we want the most money that's gonna be available as soon as possible with the ability to make sure that the funding is gonna be going towards things that are going to, uh, to decrease the achievement uh, a gap and to increase early literacy and high school success. So again, thank you so much uh, for allowing us to come here tonight. Um, you know, we'll have more information over at the table, uh, and I'm willing to answer any questions. But we're going to be organizing in your backyard, um, and I am the organizer specifically for Brockton and for around all of the gated, uh, gateway cities. So I look forward to working with you to, to spread the message and to make sure that we get uh, all the money that we deserve here in Brockton. So thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone learned a whole lot and this a test. No. <laughs> That's why I handed you, gave you a handout. I'm kidding. But I do want people to remember, realize there's a whole lot going on. I want to cover a couple of Ward 5 things. I mentioned, you know, we had Jimmy Pereira to talk about. That was one of the concerns, Plymouth and Center Street. I did find out that Congressman Lynch is now on the transportation and, and Congress, so I'm very happy about that. So he will be receiving a call from me to try to push this funding forward. It's amazing when we say, oh, it's only 1.5 million, as if, you know, we, we handle this kind of money every day. But for that, for that particular intersection, and two real pushes for that is because it's near residents and it's near schools, and that's a real big push. Two, everyone is concerned, and justifiably so, about these, quote, pot shops, end quote. Right now, nobody is close to opening except for the um, in good health that's coming in front of the planning board. Everyone needs to understand, you may come in front of planning, you may come in front of zoning. If you can't attend the meeting because you're working, have school, what have you, you can send an email, you can send a letter, you can make a phone call, and they have to read that into the minutes. Your opinion, your concern, etc. Okay, I want to emphasize that none of this is a done deal at all. I mean, I don't want to see any of them near schools, so that I'm adamant about that. Your words are being heard, believe me. As far as when I see this happening, the only places so far that I see going anywhere are the two in the medical marijuana zone that have been completely organized from the get go and have had no problems and they've been open and upfront and provided their information, their business cards, their email addresses, et cetera, to let people know what's going on. Okay. Two, infrastructure, we're doing anything in our power to get more money to do something to repair our roads. All of you that contact or email us or whatever you're completely justified with your concerns. 
I will say, though, that I had presented one road, and they said, well, you can have that done, but they'll have to tear that up because the gas company was going to be coming in for a proposal. So I said, well, let's not waste that street and go to something else. I mean, it's the toughest thing. One street, and we have over a thousand miles of street in our city alone, okay? Um, and I just, I don't want to be taken from anyone else. I will say the at-lodges get one too, so everyone knows you have the five city councils working for you, and when and, I'm sorry, Bob Sullivan ended up having to work, you know, longer than he expected, out of town. But uh, Wynn and, and Moses are available, or they're all available, so you can hint to them, oh, I'd like my street done too. Everyone that wants a street done, you're totally justified. You're never forgotten. I am wheeling and dealing. Uh, Senator Brady's um, legislative, former legislative aide, who now also works in the State House still, has pictures of all these streets in Ward 5. We went around one day for three hours taking pictures of all the streets. It was a weekday, early morning, so we didn't run into too much traffic. Anyway, to cover all this so that we can present it to the president you know, of uh, the Senate when we say we want more infrastructure money. To the governor, to, and we have, you know, our state reps that are really, really good to us about fighting for this, okay? Your, your words are being heard. We try the best we can. The best way to get a hold of people is email because then you have all the information. Works out great because you go back and forth. And I can answer someone at 6.30 in the morning. You can call me, please, 774-297-4939 or 508-584-6919. Please leave me your phone number. A lot of people are so nice, but they call and they forget to give me a phone number or something. Sometimes if they gave me their address or something, I can leave you notes. I do that a lot. Leave a lot of people notes, okay? I want you to know that we're working, a lot of us are working really hard to try to do the best we can. You can attend any of these meetings. Any of you are interested in a particular situation, you can end up on boards or commissions. Your voice is being heard. Next one that's going to be the hot topic is traffic commission. It's nothing for these meetings to last two and a half hours because people have so many concerns about their streets and they're justifiable, okay? The other thing is I want to mention CSX. That's that property that used to be a railroad that's no longer a railroad that affects a whole lot of people with streets off of Court Street in between Cary and, um, I'm sorry, commercial. And these small streets like Parker, Tabor, the first two that come to my mind, those bit, the, the end of those streets, Bowdoin, those streets are affected by the CSX property. We're keeping you in the loop. It's a waste before anything gets done. And right now, we're looking for any kind of funding we can to revamp it to the advantage of those in the community. And anyone can speak out on this, doesn't matter where you live, because all of you are affected by anything that transpires, regardless, okay? And uh, the next meeting for that we're supposed to have is on May 8th. I will provide people with more information. I try to get all the information I can on this. As far as a lot of questions, people say, I can't believe I live on a private way. Okay. This was developers did this so that they would not have to adhere to the requirements to make it officially a public way. It was sneaky. They tried to pull it now. We're getting a lot stronger and tougher about saying, uh-uh-uh-uh. But in the meanwhile, that trying to convert from private to public, even though the private street means that firefighters will go down and they will plow your street. Uh, we're working on that. I'm talking to other communities that have a more expedited way of doing this. It's involved. But trying to keep all this information, not hiding anything from you. We want to keep everything as open as possible. I know I'm not covering everything that's going to come to your mind because there's a whole lot more. There's a couple of court cases out there for people. I mean, I've been adamant about not wanting any more affordable housing in the community. A couple of things were already contracted, not because I don't think people have a right to affordable housing, but simply because Brockton has more affordable housing than any other community in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I believe that 350 others need to start catching up. And we want our schools to have the best for our kids. We want our Council on Aging to have all the services they want. We want police and fire, and that costs. And so we want the various revenue coming in. We're fortunate we have some new businesses coming in, 
and we'll keep you more posted on others that are planning and discussing coming in. We have more jobs coming in the city. We have a lot of job programs. And we do want to mention, too, with that um, you know, census that most of us started talking about here, they're already starting to hire for that. Part-time, full-time, age, all different ages for all different kinds of variety of things. So that's worth noting. And this is vital. And again, um, last but not least, we have a, a very, how would I say, exciting history. And we have an interesting present. And we hope to have a great future. In the meanwhile, uh, we have uh, Mass Memories Roadshow. It's pretty exciting that's coming Saturday, May 18th, and we really want people to come with their pictures of when they were kids or their grandparents and what their property looked like, uh, or what they, they loved when, and, you know, when they first moved to Broughton in 1967, or what have you, and talk about this. Because this is recorded history, and this is kept in files that anyone can see, and besides ourselves, all over the Commonwealth, and that, that's relatively exciting to know that something like that's happened. So we encourage you to be a part of it. There's a whole lot of other services out there. Thanks for coming. I want to thank Michael for being so patient to tape all this, and I want to thank everybody for coming here. And remember, this is an election year, people. I hope you're registered. If you're not, get registered and encourage everybody else to do so. Uh, you own this. You can't put it on eBay to sell it, and you can't have a yard sale. So we're trying to make all of this the best we can for everybody. Thank you.